Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to be here. What a great opportunity. Since I got here yesterday, I've learned it takes over 10,000 volunteer hours to get this event going. Do you, so you know who deserves an applause right now? These guys out there. Thank you so much. So I am very fortunate to be here today. I was born in Lebanon in 1967 in a small little village in South Lebanon. My country is a beautiful country, a lot of beautiful green mountains, very hilly, a lot of skiing scopes, although I don't know how to ski, but it's beautiful. Full of beaches where I grew up. This is about a block from my house. It's very fantastic. And cedar trees. For those of you that know the Phoenicians, who are my ancestors, they built their first ships out of cedar trees. And this is where my innovation gene came from, from them. I grew up in a very diverse culture. It was extremely focused on education. It's extremely important. And on history. We learned so much from our history. From there, we learned that meals were always a celebration of family. And you'll know more about that as we go. I was born into a middle-class family to a mother and father that are so wonderful, but they don't read or write. So here we go. Statistically, I am, I am at a disadvantage from the beginning. They didn't let that stop me, though. My brother, Nabil, who was 18 months older than me, we grew up together as best friends. My parents were always my role models. My mother is a very determined lady. When she was pregnant with me at nine months, and had nine other kids. One night, they had to flee our village due to war in the back of a truck. Of course, she had to do things differently. She decided to go into labor. <laughs> and it was about 11 o'clock at night as I heard the story. And then somehow they found a random house in the street somewhere, asked for help, people embraced him, took him in, found a midwife, and I was born. And what a day, what a struggle for them. And my parents sat together along with the neighbors and everyone that was around and decided to name me Jihad. <laughs> and here I am with an amazing name, means holy war everywhere you go. <laughs> Imagine traveling with that name every week, <laughs> which I will be doing in about two hours from now. And I'll go two hours early because I know I'm going to get a lot of loving. But what does my name really mean? When my parents named me that name that day, we talked about it later on as I got, you know, what's the word, got frisked with at the airports. <laughs> talked to my parents, why did you choose that name? And they told me because we were struggling. You know, life was very difficult. We didn't have anything to eat, no place to stay. We were struggling when you were born. And we named you Jihad because it means struggle, uh, sacrifice for other and then strive. So it made sense to them, and it makes sense to me, but unfortunately, not for the rest. <laughs> then, in 1975, our world was shattered. Civil war was started, just when we thought life was good. And that really took away all the good days. No more good days. The place where I built my memory in my father's shop became a place of danger. During that time, I've learned that hard work, perseverance, always pays off. My parents taught me that. And so did war and devastation. I saw unspeakable things. I saw men get shot right in front of me, women and kids. And you know what the hardest part was? Not seeing them get shot or just fall to the ground. The hardest part was I couldn't come to help them. Because if I did, then I would be dead too. You learn to move on, but it's hard. Then my war-torn village became harder and harder to be in it. One day in particular, we walk into school, holding our books, and we learn to walk in lines. We can never walk next to each other. In case there's a bomb or shooting, then one or two of us will die instead of about 10 of us. That day, there's a man, there's a man on a motorcycle driving along, and he's got oranges and bread on the back of his motorcycle. Suddenly, this man was hit by a, an army vehicle, and we can hear the crushing sound of his bones and his motorcycle as these trucks went over him. We couldn't look, because if we did, there would be some consequences. As soon as the trucks went by, we ran to his aid. 
as we got to see him closer to him, he's twitching. And then we saw the blood all over and his guts everywhere. And suddenly the twitching stopped and the man died. You know what? I just stood up, picked up my books, I walked to school and did not look back. From that day on in my life, I learned that the things that I cannot control or help, I have to pick up my books and move on so I can continue my journey. And I'm here today to share with you my journey. It is hard, but sometimes we have to do that. So every time I say, I picked up my books, I went to school, it doesn't mean I just went to school. It means anything in every day that we do. Every obstacle that we face is a test. So that's what I mean when I say that today. Not too long after that, I was standing next to my father as he was watching everything he ever built being burnt. Everything. And all he can say, God gives and God takes. I was angry because we were losing everything. He was so calm. What an amazing lesson for me. Learn from my father. As my parents were worried about me, as I owned two pair of jeans, as you can see there, <laughs> true, <laughs> and two t-shirts. But if you look at this picture, I own an amazing, powerful tool in my hands that I still cherish and love today and constantly get it more of it, more, more and more of it. Books, knowledge. I love knowledge. I am always thirsty for more. My parents were thinking about me eating, drinking, or wearing clothes. I was thinking about this beautiful, amazing tool. How can I better myself? How can I improve myself? So I focused on education. That was my only way out. My only option was success. Failure was not. In 1985, life, life was very dangerous. Uh, my only two options at that time, for the only time in my life, for a period of about four, six months, there were only two options, either I stay, on, stay and die, which if I couldn't leave, I would die, or leave. So my brother and I, Nabil, we managed to gather $600. We went to the embassy, got visas, and then suddenly we realized I was 15 some and he was maybe 18 some. We didn't think it through. We got the visas. We only had enough money for one of us to leave. So he was the oldest, so he made the decision. And here I am on a plane 12 hours later, coming to America. I was excited. I was extremely excited. And guess what I was doing on the plane? Doing some physics formula, because that's what I love. I wanted to be a nuclear physicist. Then, as the plane became to land, I realized I only got $80, two pairs of pants. What am I going to do with that? I got to the airport and got out of the plane, and there's no one there to greet me. What a disappointment. That's OK. Kept walking around to figure out what else I can do. I heard a bunch of kids speaking French. I went to them and I said, hey, comment ça va, and can you help me? And they made a phone call to a family member. Two hours later, they came and picked me up. Guess what was my first question was? When can I start working? They looked at me like I was crazy. I'm like, I'm not. 6 a.m. the second day, I was on Broadway and 28th Street selling umbrellas. The beauty part, I sold the box by 10 a.m. Guess what? It wasn't raining. I was desperate. <laughs> you know, I was fascinated and intrigued by how much this country can offer. I said, there's no way I could not succeed here. So I went to work. A few months later, my brother came, Nabil, followed me. We moved to Durban together. We started working, gathering money, and life was good. We have enough money to almost go to college, but again, only for one of us. Unfortunately, soon after that, my brother was murdered. And for the first time in my life, I felt it was over. My father called and said, come home. I considered it for a second. But then I remembered what he said. And I called him back. I said, Dad, I cannot give up right now. God gave us Nabil, and God took him back. But I'm here to fulfill his destiny. He was the one that was, wanted to be a doctor, not me. I wanted to be a nuclear physicist. So I went on with life, didn't look back. Went back to visit my family. I realized how poor they are. Things have gotten so much worse. I cut my vacation very short, came back to America, bought a car, $875, got four jobs, worked, sent them money. I wanted, to see, I wanted to see that smile on their face. They're my first unconditional love. Then I met my wife as I was at Wayne State University, and she's obviously my second and best unconditional love. And this is the shirt that I wore on our first date. 
And later on, she told me that that was the ugliest thing she ever seen. <laughs> and she is the most beautiful person. And guess who bought me this shirt last night? <laughs> I don't know what she's trying to say, but. <laughs> I finished medical school, I went back, just so I can see the smile on my father and fulfill his dream. I became a doctor for him, and then for me. But I'm still the innovative guy that I wanted to be. My, then I became a cardiologist, just to kind of give him a little bit more of a kick. And then country, my country started to get better, rebuilding started, and then my wife and I decided to get married. We got married after my residency, and we were blessed with two beautiful kids, Ali named after my father, and Jenna. And just when I thought life was getting up, great. You do that to a jihad, Mustafa. <laughs> it's like. So every time you think there's no more obstacles and life is good, and then you get hit with something else, then God blessed us with the best thing ever, our son Nabil. Nabil was born with a genetic disorder called Knunin syndrome. After he was born, 12 hours later, he required a life-saving procedure. He had it. Two months later, he had to have open heart surgery. Today, Nabil is the love of our life. Without him, life won't be the same. But he's another testimony about when you face an obstacle, you don't just walk away from it. You face it and you deal with it. There's always a reason for it. And with every obstacle comes an opportunity. Innovation is my life, is my love. It's my first passion of education. So while preparing this talk, I reflect upon the parallels in my life. My approach today isn't different than when I was 14 years old, running away from being getting killed. The difference today is I run after the things that I love and the obstacles that I face and how can I overcome them. So, what is it that I looked after in terms of innovations? I looked around and there's so many people in the world that are getting amputations of their legs with no reason. The more I digged into it, I realized there are ways and means of helping these patients. So I used my basic knowledge of physics and my understanding of medical devices and I took what everybody made for something else and used it to preserve limbs. And my success became a little bit better every day. How? I use old tools for new techniques. It was very simple. I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. So now, I spend my career helping patients with heart disease and severe critical limb ischemia. Do you guys know that if you have critical limb ischemia, your chance of dying is higher than colon cancer, breast cancer, breast prostate cancer, and on and on and on. But yet, if you say someone has a prostate prostate cancer or colon cancer will stop, the world stops. But actually, if you have critical limb ischemia, your chance of death is so much higher. This is why I'm dedicating my life to this disease. It's a deadly disease. I attack my job like any other obstacles in my life. I look for the solution to an unmet need, work until I find my way through the problem, like this one right here. This is a patient that was scheduled to have their leg amputated. Came to us from out of state, and as you can see here, there is some blood flow, but not complete. My team and I got together, we worked, we restored the blood flow. We did something that is unspeakable, but we use old tools with new technique, innovations, always, always the key, and obstacles and overcoming. So we continue, my team and I have pioneered many new techniques for critical limb ischemia. Remember, new techniques, the technology is there. All we had to do is figure out a way of using it better and improving it. We've reduced the amputation rate at our institution significantly, only in the course of about four years. It didn't take us long. You know why? Because giving up was never an option for us. These people that came to us, if they had an amputation, their mortality rate, meaning they're gonna die within five years, over 50%, there's not much that can kill you that quick. We all have dreams. We all have the power to turn our dreams into a reality or just let them stay daydreams. I used to be a daydreamer one day, but I decided to do something about it. I'm no longer a daydreamer, I go get it. The only reality that makes your dream come true is to face it, face your obstacles and never, never give up. Failure, failure can be the beginning of the journey to success. Please remember that. It is good to fail. In fact, when I fail, I enjoy it because I learned how to do it better the next time. And I believe if you have never failed, you've never tried enough. 
So you can choose to fail backward and sit back and watch life go by or fail forward. Get up knowing that you're going to fail again. And when you fail again, you get up again and try again until you succeed. Until you decide to do that, you're not going to go and get it. Today, when I look back at my life, starting out age 15 in a foreign country with no money and little support, I statistically had no chance for success. But that did not stop me. This is America. This is the land of opportunity. There's no opportunities in any, any place in the world that is, that is available to you more than it is in here. What is your dream? What would you do to achieve it? Will you accept failure and sit in the backseat and watch the world go by? Without a doubt, in your mind, you should, do the, you should be the person who goes and gets it. Because you know what? If you don't go and get it, somebody else is going to go and get it. Somebody will go get it. Why can't you be that person who goes and gets it? Innately, you need to know your, your natural abilities. I know I'm a good physicist. I'm a good scientist, but trust me, I am not a good articulate person. I don't know how to write a paper. There are a lot of things that I don't know how to do. But I know my limitations, and therefore, I surround myself with inspiring people, like these people here today, like the people that I work with, and also surround myself with good working ethic people. Many of my innovations and my devices have been a you know, lifelong work in, work in progress until I invented this device here. <laughs> Wish I never did. It's a device actually um, that takes a clot from the heart or the leg during a heart attack. So it saves people's lives. Until I was coming back from Vegas after we had a meeting, and then during, at the airport when I'm going through, someone decided to look at it. <laughs> but hey, I give that guy a lot of credit. He was very smart. Things that looks like a gun with a guy named Jihad Mustafa. <laughs> Come with me, sir. But anyway, no matter where you are in your life, do not forget what's important. Don't forget where you came from. This is where I came from. I came from nowhere. And don't forget where you are going. My dad was a very wise man. He told me, success is not an accident. And I always remember that. And he also said, it doesn't come to you. And I always remember that. If you want it, you have to go and get it. So, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please go and get it. Thank you.